We are in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 15 tonight. We're on page 35 of the notes, and we are ready to start. And let's start by kind of backing up to review where we are. We are in the third part of the book of Daniel, and that is chapters 8 to 12. And in our outline, it's titled, The Prophetic Plan for Israel. So from chapter 8 through the end of the book, series of uh, prophecies that center around what is God's plan for Israel. Uh, num Roman numeral 1, Daniel's vision of the ram and the male goat, chapter 8. That's the chapter we're in. And then A, the revelation of the vision. <clears throat> so the heart of the vision that is providing this prophecy is in verses 1 to 12 of chapter 8. It began with Daniel in his vision seeing a ram. And the ram represented the next empire that was coming on the world scene. Daniel was seeing this during the Babylonian Empire. And this is a prophecy of the next empire, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. Then he sees a, a male goat, and that represents the Greek Empire. He, in seeing that vision, saw prophecy of Alexander the Great who of course is going to be the great conquering general who's going to expand uh, the, the uh, Greek Empire throughout the then known world. And then in the dream, in the vision, he also sees what represents the fact that Alexander would die young and his empire would be divided up among his four generals. And then in the vision he sees a little horn uh, prop up uh, among those four. And this is a prophecy of a man who is going to come from the empire of one of those generals whose name is Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a tyrant and uh, he conquered the land of Israel and uh, did everything that he could to disrupt the Jewish worship, but he didn't succeed. And so there's going to be prophecy about him. And then B, where we ended last week, the length of the vision, and that's in verses 13 to 14, talks about a period of 2,300 days, which each of those days, um, and when you put that together, you have six and a third years, and um, each of those days is counting off the period of time that's going to be this terrible time of, of uh, devastation of the Jewish people that's going to be headed up by Antiochus Epiphanes and it's going to end on a, on a what becomes a very special day. It's going to end on what is now celebrated by the Feast of Hanukkah when the Maccabees came to the temple and uh, cleansed it of all of the impurity that Antiochus Epiphanes had done. And uh, it, it really, really is a, a spectacular event, which is commemorated every year uh, on the feast of, of uh, the Jewish holiday of, of Hanukkah. Well, now we come to Roman numeral number C on page 35, and that is the interpretation of the dream. And that's in verses 15 to 27. Now, I did a lot of the interpretation as we walked through the actual dream. But now we will have some more. <clears throat> in verses 15 through 22, there's going to be prophecy of the rulers who are going to come on the scene prior to Antiochus Epiphanes. Then... Uh, um, and, and that also will include Antiochus Epiphanes. Then, in verses 23 to 27, it jumps ahead to the Antichrist, who of course is still future. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes is kind of a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Everything that we know about Antiochus Epiphanes, all the atrocities that he did, and so on, are magnified 
later when it comes to the Antichrist. But the path of the two men is so, so similar. And so there's going to be prophecies here where uh, we'll say, well, Antiochus Epiphanes did this. But then on the other hand, we know of prophecy that the Antichrist is going to do that even more. So it, it, it really is an interesting parallel to see, and we'll be seeing that as we go through. So let's look at it beginning on number one, the interpretation of the vision, and that's chapter 8, verses 15 through 19. So reading Daniel 8, 15, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Now you can imagine, he's curious. He's also had the experience with Nebuchadnezzar's dream and so on, that God would, would give the interpretation. And so naturally, uh, he can't help but wonder, what does this mean? And is God going to reveal it to me? And so on. So he sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And lo and behold, uh, his request is going to be answered. God is going to give him the interpretation. But first of all, he sees this man. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated man there is a Hebrew word for man that is emphasizing a mighty man, uh, a great man, not just a normal run-of-the-mill man, but a mighty man. It is never, it's a word that is never used of just any man, but a great warrior, a strong man, a man in prime, and so on. And in this case, it's going to refer to Gabriel, the angel. Now, that's not to say that Gabriel is a man, but the idea in calling him this super duper man is it's pointing out um, he is he's remarkable of course he's an angel so he's strong and powerful and so on the Hebrew word uh, for for this Hebrew word for man is Gabor in English it would be G-A-B-O-R Gabriel's name has come down to us as Gabriel or Gabriel, the E-L is one of the names for God. So Gabriel means God's mighty man. And uh, there's probably a play on words here in verse 15 when it says that he had seen this man and then we're going to find out that this man turns out to be the angel whose name is Gabriel. So it's a play on the word man, which becomes uh, significant because there's going to be another man mentioned here, and it's going to be a different word for man. It's going to be the word Adam, which is, of course, the name of the first man, but the word Adam is one of the Hebrew words for man as well. So he sees this person with the appearance of this Gabor, this mighty man. Verse 16 and I heard a man's voice. Now, that's the Hebrew word Adam or Adam in Hebrew. Uh, and so what it's what is communicating here is he hears a regular male voice. Now, who could this be that is speaking this way? Well, the interesting thing is that when you look at all the alter alternatives, the best idea is that this is God himself and God communicating to Daniel through a man's voice. So that's, that's what's going on here. And the reason why it has to be God is who can command angels? There's only one who can command angels and that's God and that's what this man is going to do or this, this person behind the man's voice. So I heard a man's voice, and uh, between the banks of the Uli, remember that's that canal uh, where he is, uh, and it called Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So it's a command to an angel, only one who can command an angel is God. 
So the man's voice is a male voice used by God directly to communicate uh, to Daniel. However, this is very interesting, very unique, that Gabriel, an angel, is named here. This is the first time in scripture that an angel is named by, or is given by name in scripture, with the exception of Lucifer, who becomes Satan. And so that would be a different category of angels. That is, that's the demonic category. But as far as the good angels, this is the first time in scripture that one is named, and it happens to be Gabriel. Uh, he's going to be mentioned again in chapter 9, verse 21. And then, of course, he's going to be mentioned by name in the New Testament. In the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 16, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 19, and verse 26, when he appears to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and to the Virgin Mary. Um, who is the only other angel that's mentioned in Scripture? Michael. So there's only two names given in Scripture, not counting Lucifer, who is Satan, Michael and Gabriel. Uh, Michael is mentioned later on in Daniel, and that's going to be Daniel chapter 13, verse 21, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and then Michael is mentioned by name in the New Testament in two places, Jude 9 and Revelation 12, 7. Catholic tradition has a lot of other names for angels, uh, but they are not found uh, in the Bible. So anyway, he calls uh, Gabriel, make this man, that is Daniel, understand the vision. So he came near, that would be Gabriel, where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. That's, that's the natural reaction to seeing an angel. Because when they appear as an angel, they are full of the brightness of the glory of God. It's a very frightening thing. And uh, so that's a, a normal occurrence as far as uh, seeing angels. I was frightened, fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man. Now the term son of man emphasizes his frailty. I mean, here he's in front of this great Gabor, this mighty man, as it were. And he looks at Daniel. He says, son of man. That emphasizes his, uh, his frailty, um, his, his um, difficulty, just as a mere man, in understanding all of the magnitude of the things of God and the things that God has to reveal to him. Uh, it isn't um, within his natural power to understand all that God is going to do with Israel, but God's going to reveal it to him. By God's grace, he's going to reveal it to him. And um, that's a good reminder of us. We are so puny also compared to God, and God in his grace has revealed his things to us in his word that uh, we, can, we can learn. We don't deserve it. It's part of God's grace that he's given that. So he, he calls him, O son of man, and that the vision is for the time of the end. Now the time of the end is a clue here that this prophecy has more than just to do with Antiochus Epiphanes. That it stretches all the way to the end of time. The end of uh, the era of man's kingdoms. It stretches all the way to the time that's still future, to the end of the time of Antichrist, and the coming of Jesus Christ in his second coming. So it is literal when it talks about that this is a vision of for the end of time. That, by the way, that term is used later on, we'll see in chapter 12, verse 4, specifically of the time approaching the second coming and setting up the kingdom. There's no doubt about it there. So that same expression here, uh, when we begin to look at it in its context, 
is has to be speaking of that future time, the still future, just before the Lord Jesus Christ comes in his second coming, uh, just uh, at the end of the time of the Antichrist. So that tells us that verses 1 to 14 are talking to Daniel about things that are future to him, but um, they are before the first coming of Christ. So verses 1 to 14, prophecy of things future to Daniel, but uh, up until the first coming of Christ. Verses 15 to 26 are future events that are still yet future because they will precede the second coming of Christ. And um, verses 1 to 14 are prophesy uh, some terrible times for Israel, but there are worse times coming for Israel uh, before Jesus comes again. Then in verse um, 17, or verse 18 rather, And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep. It's almost like he fainted. Uh, he was just overcome in this experience of what he saw, what he heard, and he fainted with my face to the ground. But he touched me, and he made me stand up. And he said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation. Again, that is a term that is referring not to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but to the time that is still future, the time of the Antichrist, just before Christ comes again. We have a term for that, and that is the Great Tribulation. The Tribulation lasts for seven years. The Great Tribulation is the second half, so the second three and a half years. And um, this, this term this, of this indignation is going to show up again in chapter 11, verse 36, where it's going to refer to the Antichrist's anger against Israel. Uh, Antiochus time was a time of indignation, but nothing compared to the indignation at the time, future coming of the Antichrist. So um, it's a tremendous, tremendous um, word to Daniel that he is about to uh, get understanding of remarkable things. Well, then turning the page, and, uh, and that last phrase of verse 19, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Then turning the page, we have number two, and that is the interpretation of the ram. And you remember the ram in this dream that Daniel had represented the Medo-Persian Empire. That was still future, and when Daniel saw it. And it's the empire that's going to conquer the Babylonian Empire that Daniel was living in the midst of. So look at verse 20. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. So two horns representing a kingdom of Media, a kingdom of Persia, those kingdoms united for the great kingdom of the Medo-Persian Empire, which will conquer the Babylonian Empire. Then we have three, the interpretation of the male goat, verses 21 and 22. The male goat represents the Greek Empire, more in particular, Alexander the Great, who conquered in the name of Greece. Look at verse 21, and the goat, and we saw last week that it's interesting that it's the goat in this dream, and that played a role in Greece's history that uh, they had this legend that a goat uh, appeared to them and showed them where the capital city was. And we talked about that last week. Um, Daniel wouldn't have known anything about that. No one in Babylon knew anything about it because it was far in the future. But it, it fits in exactly here. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. First king, not of Greece, 
the, this is referring to Alexander the Great, but Alexander the Great was not the first king of Greece itself. That was his father, who was Philip of Macedon, but he's the first king of the Greek, of the Greek Empire. And uh, the first is going to be followed by the four who are going to rule simultaneously. So, um, verse 22, as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. So we saw last week that that was a prophecy that Alexander the Great would die very suddenly, very young, unexpectedly, and uh, he would be replaced by his four generals who would divide up his kingdom. And that's exactly uh, what is pictured here, uh, but not with his power. None of them achieved the power and status that Alexander the Great did. That brings us to number four, which is uh, really the, the key part of this whole uh, dream, and that's number four, interpretation of the little horn. That's chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. Now, this little horn represents Antiochus Epiphanes. And remember from last week, where did he come from? Well, one of those four generals who, who divided up the empire was a man named Seleucus. And uh, he became the, uh, the head of the area of Syria and Babylon and so on. One of his descendants is this man named Antiochus Epiphanes. And he is the little horn. But it's, the little horn is far more than that because the little horn also is a prophecy of the future Antichrist who will be at the latter end of their kingdom that we're going to see uh, here. So let's look at verse 23. At the latter end of their kingdom. So what kingdom? It's not talking about the generals because that's four kingdoms. The previous, the previous verse said four kingdoms shall arise from his nation. And then verse 23, at the latter end of their kingdom. So it's not kingdoms plural, so it's not the four generals. This is looking ahead uh, to the future to, this is the latter times of the kingdom of the Gentiles. That this whole period of world history, whether it be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, so on, Antichrist kingdom and so on, from God's perspective, it's all one kingdom. It's man's kingdom. But at the latter end of the day, when man has, is having his day, at the latter end of that is coming this little horn. So again, the little horn represents Antiochus, but also uh, the Antichrist. Interesting terminology for the Antichrist because in the previous chapter, chapter 7, there was a prophecy uh, concerning the Antichrist and he was a little horn in that prophecy as well. Uh, so the two are united uh, in, in that regard. So again, uh, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgression, transgressors have reached their limit, in other words, when sin has reached its pinnacle, uh, there's coming a day where sin will have reached its limit, that God's going to allow it. And God's going to bring everything to a conclusion. So again, this shows us that it's talking about the future Antichrist, not Antiochus. And um, can you imagine what it's going to be like during that period? Because the church will have been removed and uh, the church indwell, indwelt by the Holy Spirit uh, has been a restraint on sin. I know sometimes it's hard for us to realize that because it looks to us like sin is just absolutely out of control. But uh, there is a restraint because the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit is here. 
But when the church is removed and that restraint is lifted, sin will reach its pinnacle. And that's what it's talking about here. So the transgressors have reached their limit. A king of bold face is going to come on the scene. Now the King James Version translates that, a king of fierce countenance. And this is referring to the Antichrist, and this is one of the titles of the Antichrist. And so often when you hear uh, prophecy being taught and preached, you will hear reference to the coming uh, king using the King James Version here, the king of fierce countenance. Uh, well, that's Antichrist. But a better translation is with a bold face. That's a more literal translation of the Hebrew. And it's the idea that the Antichrist is going to be fierce. He's going to be intimidating. He's going to be mercilessly cruel. By the way, that same Hebrew word is used in Proverbs chapter 7 verse 13 of a prostitute who is brazen and shameless and full of an audacity. And that's going to be true of the Antichrist. Then it tells us something else that's interesting about the Antichrist. He's not only going to be of bold face, but he's going to be one who understands riddles. You say, well, that sounds kind of childish. Does that mean that uh, he and his friends just sit around telling riddles all day? No, that's, that's not what it's saying. Um, it is a translation of a Hebrew uh, term that means dark sayings or hard sayings. And it's, the idea is that it is a mark of intelligence. For instance, uh, it is used, that same expression, is used of Solomon's abilities in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. And you remember Solomon was a marvel because God had gifted him with wisdom. And the queen of Sheba, for instance, came from so far and she said, I hear that, that you can solve mysteries and riddles and you speak in, and, and understand and the term, the same Hebrew word is used here, either uh, in dark saying or hard saying. So, Antichrist is going to be a man of great mental ability. The idea behind that uh, also is he's going to be a great problem solver. He's going to be the one that's going to have a solution to the Middle East problem. Every president for I don't know how long has tried to solve the Middle East problem. They have their Middle East plan. Nothing ever works. The Russians have had their Middle East plan. Nothing works. But someday there's coming a man on the world stage who's going to get the world's attention in that he's going to be a, have a solution to the Middle East problem. All that is coming out of this, this expression that he understands riddles. He's going to, then he's going to establish peace with Israel. He'll establish a peace treaty and so on. He's going to guarantee their peace for seven years, but then he's going to break that halfway through and that's going to usher in uh, the Great Tribulation. Um, in the case of the Antichrist, the word also has that connotation of the dark sayings. He understands the dark sayings. And that's a reminder that he will be indwelt by Satan. And uh, Satan influences his mind. And he's going to be a demonic genius because of, of Satan filling him and, and his mind. So think about it. He's going to have Satan's knowledge at his disposal. Now, it's interesting. We call him the Antichrist. We typically think of anti as meaning against. 
and certainly he will be against Christ. But in the Bible, the word that's translated anti also has the idea of in the place of. And the Antichrist is going to be in the place of Christ. Satan is going to put him on the, on the world stage as a counterfeit of the real Christ. In that sense, he's going to be in the place of, a counterfeit, and uh, so on. And it's interesting that we think of, of, of Christ and we think of what the Bible says that as a Christian we are filled with the mind of Christ and we, um, we have access, uh, the Bible says, uh, in whom we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge we have in Christ. Well, Satan comes along with his false Christ, his imitation Christ. And he's filled with all the wisdom and knowledge of Satan, in contrast to Christ, who is filled with all the wisdom and knowledge of the Godhead. And over and over again, you see these contrasts between Christ uh, and the Antichrist. In verse 20, um, and then it says in verse 23, he understands riddles and he will arise. Come on the scene. Verse 24, his power shall be great, but not by his own power. He is empowered by whom? Satan. Hold on to Daniel and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 2. Revelation 13, 2. Well, actually, why don't we start with Revelation 13, 1. This is a, this is a prophecy in Revelation of the Antichrist. It says in verse 1, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. That beast is Antichrist. Rising out of the sea, out of the nations of the earth, out of humanity, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns. It, it um, uh, comes out of this revived Roman Empire uh, that, of which he is uh, one of the ten rulers of that, and he's going to become the supreme ruler. And um, he has ten diadems. Those are the crowns of a king, or diadems, and on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw, that is the Antichrist, I saw was like a leopard. And it's interesting what what is done in this uh, in this presentation of the Antichrist in the book of Revelation in that it, um, it takes the animals which represent kingdoms from Daniel chapter 7, the vision that we saw in the previous chapter of Daniel, Daniel where you had the leopard and the bear and so on, and it takes every one of those animals and uses them as a representation of the Antichrist. For instance, uh, it, it says he was like a leopard. Um, and we saw in Daniel 7 that the leopard, of course, is such a fast animal. And that was a representation of the Antichrist, or excuse me, of Alexander the Great, with the speed with which he co conquered the world. Well, here in Revelation 13, Antichrist is attributed with that. He's going to have that speed in conquering the world. He's going to be like the leopard. And not only that, but its feet were like a bear's. And the bear in, in Daniel 7 represented the Medo-Persian Empire, which was um, uh, ferocious in its strength. It had a, a huge army, a mighty army, and so on. Very uh, aggressive and Alexander, or, uh, Antichrist is going to be like that. Then it talks about, and it was like a lion's mouth. And the lion was in that, uh, that vision as well. And the lion's mouth is raging, you know, roaring, and then uh, tearing its prey apart, and, and harmful, and so on. And Antichrist is going to be like that. And um, then it says, and to, its, to it the dragon, the dragon was earlier, 
and it was uh, yeah, that was in chapter 12 and that was a representation of Satan so Satan gave his power and his throne and great authority he gave his his power he gave his throne um, Antichrist uh, is is put in place as it were by Satan he wouldn't be where he gets were it not for Satan's working behind the scenes and and then he has Satan's authority uh, he comes and assumes all this power but behind it is the working of Satan and by the way it's an interesting parallel that uh, Satan tempted Jesus remember and offered him the kingdoms of the world if he would fall down and worship him Jesus refused here comes Antichrist he does not refuse and Satan goes all out to give him authority and power so Satan is the mentor as it were of the Antichrist source of his cleverness and cunning and the one who gives him power even to the point it comes out in Revelation of doing miracles and so on well back here in in Daniel in chapter 8 verse 24 so his power shall be great but not by his own power and he shall cause fearful destruction and again it's not just by his power but by the supernatural power of Satan and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men that is powerful men who oppose him now back in chapter 7 we saw a prophecy that when the Antichrist comes to power he's going to be one of ten rulers of the revived Roman Empire right at the very beginning uh, there's going to be something that prompts him to absolutely destroy three of those ten kings and uh, he's going to become number one and uh, so you kind of uh, have that uh, picture here those three mighty men he's going to overcome um, there will be Jewish mighty men that uh, he certainly will overcome many mighty men that he will overcome and then the last part of verse 24 and the people who are the saints that is the saints refers to God's people Israel and uh, he will destroy the book of Zechariah prophesies two-thirds of the Jewish people but not all of them because God always has a remnant and uh, the Jewish nation will never be annihilated well turning the page we then come to chapter 8 verse 25 <clears throat> by his cunning he shall make prosper under his hand and in his own mind cunning is the idea of deceitfulness uh, history says that Antiochus was a master of deceit but he's going to be exceeded only by Antichrist uh, turn over to 2nd Thessalonians in the New Testament 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 2nd Thessalonians 2 verse 3 let no one deceive you in any way for that day will not come that's referring to the coming day of the Lord unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed man of lawlessness is one of the titles of the Antichrist so in 2nd Thessalonians 2 3 unless the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God uh, he is um, going to put himself in that position and then look down at verses 9 and 10 
The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. He will have the power to do miracles. Whenever there are miracles, we have to test what is the doctrine that this miracle worker is producing. Because not all miracles would be a guarantee, oh, this is a man of God. In this case, this is a man of Satan, and he's doing miracles. And then verse 10, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. He will deceive. He will be the, the world's prime deceiver. And in this case, it's very interesting how Paul points out who are the ones who will be deceived, but the non-believers. Um, the people that come to salvation during the tribulation, they're not going to be deceived. They are the children of God. God will keep them uh, from that deception. Well, turning back to Daniel 8, uh, verse 25. So, by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and his own mind he shall become great, even to the point of exalting himself as God, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians. As he does that, continuing in verse 25, without warning, he shall destroy many. So he's very cunning. He tricks a lot of people. He tricks Israel into believing that he will keep the peace for them. He makes this peace treaty for seven years. But other scriptures point out the timing at the midway point. He will, he will turn on Israel and become their enemy. And that's what's being referred to here as without warning. It's interesting that Antiochus did that too. And I put a quotation on here from the book of 1 Maccabees. We saw a quotation last time from 1 Maccabees. Remember, uh, the books of Maccabees are in the Catholic edition of the Bible. Uh, they are good history books that were written between the time of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament, we do not believe they are scripture. We do not believe they are inspired by God. A couple of reasons for that. One, the Jewish people did not accept them as scripture. And so our Old Testament corresponds with the scripture of the Jewish people. Plus, there have been found some minor uh, contradictions and inaccuracies in the book of, of uh, Maccabees, which, if they're scripture, they can't have. But they are good history. So this quote from Maccabees about Antiochus. He came to Jerusalem with an impressive force and addressing them with what appeared to be peaceful words. He gained their confidence. Then suddenly, falling, he fell on the city and dealing it a terrible blow and destroying many of the people of Israel. He pillaged the city and set it on fire, tore down its houses and encircling wall, took the women and children captive, and commandeered the cattle. That was Antiochus. That is, look, is picturing also what the Antichrist will do even to the further extreme. And uh, some of that is going to be explained in the next chapter of Daniel, chapter 9, and especially verse 27. But look at what happens next. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. Who do you think the prince of princes is? It's Christ, Messiah. And here is going to be the Antichrist, and he will have the audacity to raise his sword against Messiah when Messiah uh, comes again. But what's going to happen to Antichrist? And he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Now, going back to Antiochus, 
Same kind of thing happened with Antiochus. According to history, he just became very uh, mysteriously deathly ill uh, after hearing of the victory of the Maccabees at the temple in Jerusalem. And he died shortly after that. In a similar way, uh, fulfilling this prophecy, Antichrist is going to be destroyed supernaturally by Jesus Christ when Jesus comes again and he's going to be thrown into the pit forever and ever. Hold on to Daniel and turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 19 you have the prophecy in the book of Daniel or book of Revelation of the end of the Antichrist, his defeat and his destruction. Let's read that beginning in verse 11 of Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now, the one who's going to be on the white horse is the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast from when Jesus entered into Jerusalem at the end of his ministry, and he enters on a, a Jerusalem in a donkey. That is a symbol of humility. When he comes again, he's not coming on a donkey. He's coming on a white horse. In the Roman Empire days, conquering generals w rode on white horses. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. So terms referring to Jesus. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. First time he came, he humbled himself, went through all the suffering of a cross, but when he comes again, he's coming in judgment and he makes war against uh, the non-believers and against Satan. Verse 12, his eyes are like a flame of fire, which again speaks of judgment. On his head are many diadems, those are a king's golden crowns. What kind of crown did Jesus wear? Crown of thorns. Very, very different in his first coming. Second coming, a king's crown of gold. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. That's probably referring to the fact that Jesus, as much as we get to know about him from scripture we just in no way can know the depths of his character his holiness his righteousness we we just scratch the surface in verse 13 he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood which would be the blood coming from the judgment that is going on. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. That very name that John identifies him as in the beginning of John's Gospel. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so on. And John is the human author of the book of Revelation. And that word, that, that title is used here. Verse 14, and the armies of heaven. Not just one army. You could say Jesus and his army. But it's more specific than that. Armies, plural. Uh, Jesus is in charge of the armies of the angels. And there are times where he's called the Lord of hosts. And hosts refers to the army of the angels. But when he comes back, he will have a second army. And that will be the church, us, believers, who will have been caught up to be with him. And we will come back with him as well. And then also, there are those who during the tribulation come to faith in Christ and are martyred. They will come back with him. All combined, we are the armies of the Messiah, the armies of heaven. 
arrayed in fine linen. That's always a picture of righteousness, that we have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. White and pure, we're following him on white horses. We'll get to ride a horse. And uh, verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. A picture would be this angel in a prominent place where everyone can see. And a loud voice with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God. Now the location of all of this is seen in the earlier verses, and that's Armageddon, which is in the land of Israel. And isn't it interesting that Israel is in the flyover path of the largest migration of birds anywhere on the planet? Thousands and thousands and thousands of birds cross over Israel twice a year, going from Europe and Russia and the cold climate down to Africa for the winter. And then they go back every year, two times a year. They've been doing it, and they will continue to do it. And so that uh, provides the setting where the God directs the birds, come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings. It's not a pretty picture, but it is a picture of judgment. The flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, that is the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth with their armies, so they are under... Antichrist and different divisions of the world gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And in verse 20, and the beast was captured. That's the defeat of the Antichrist. And with it the false prophet. False prophet is not prophesied in Daniel 8, but he is the assistant, as it were, to the Antichrist. And um, who is in its presence, had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two, that is the Antichrist and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire. That is a term referring to hell, the eternal place of judgment. And it's described as the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. In the Middle East, in the area of the Dead Sea, there is this that uh, has been called sulfur that comes to the surface. And it's hot and so on, and it smells terrible. And verse 21, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him, and so on. So, there you have a greater detail of the defeat of the Antichrist. Turning back here to Daniel chapter 8, that last phrase in verse 25, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Antichrist is going to be defeated not by men, but by the Lord uh, himself. Verse 26, the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. That's a great statement. It means it's going to come to pass. It's not only true, but then he's told, but seal up the vision. That is, preserve it. So it's a scroll. So the idea is roll it up, roll up the scroll and preserve it for examination at a future time. What this is telling Daniel is it's really not going to be understandable to Daniel. Uh, he is, is way back there in, in old ancient history. He's, he's just not going to be capable of understanding all of this that's going to happen in the future. But seal it up so that in the future it can be read. 
and it can be understood. Uh, he, he, he's going to tell it orally to other people and preserve it and so on, but not until time goes on further, such as in our time, are we going to be able to understand it uh, to the degree uh, compared to the people of Daniel's day. It's an interesting contrast, last chapter of Revelation. Revelation ends and John is told, take the scroll and don't seal it. In other words, from the very beginning, the book of Revelation would be understandable and open for God's people to read. And it certainly uh, still is today to be read and expounded and explained. And, um, but he says, for it refers to many days from now. And, of course, that's talking about the future time of the Antichrist. Then lastly, we have five, the response of Daniel, verse 27. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business. He still is an official in the, in the royal palace of King Belshazzar of the Babylonian Empire. And he has work to do. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So he records it with little understanding of it. But the intent was that future generations would have it, such as us, and begin to understand it. Well, what a, what a prophecy chapter 8 is. There was an Alexander, there was an Antiochus, and someday there will be an Antichrist. Uh, God's word is true. Well, we will end it there and pick up next week, beginning one of the most remarkable chapters in the Bible, and that is uh, Daniel chapter 9, the, the chapter that has the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And we'll get into that, and it is truly, truly remarkable. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, how we do thank you that you've given us your word. You've given us revelation, which helps us to understand the book of Daniel. And that Daniel was sealed up. And Daniel and his generation couldn't understand it all. But you've given us that ability through your revelation of the New Testament to put these pieces together and to understand it. We thank you for that. We thank you for reminding us that you are in control. And we pray that we would trust you and also have a, a, a burden for others to come to know you while there still is time. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.